Good afternoon. Uh, Tess, can you guys hear us? Great. Uh, so in this talk, uh, we will be presenting you guys our experience in managing Spark cluster uh, at large scale by utilizing the elasticity of the cloud uh, uh, environments. And my name is Yu Hao, and I'm the, t uh, I'm the lead of um, infrastructure team at Datawiser. So um, here are the outcomes of, of, of the system that we built uh, by ourselves. So uh, we managed to scale the peak uh, of our Spark environment uh, by 4x uh, before the system and uh, to support our uh, company business. In the meantime, we cut down the cloud cost by 5x uh, compared with some naive uh, approach. And we also uh, pay attention to the, our operation cost because we are a startup company, we are very sensitive on that. So just a little bit about uh, our company. So uh, we are a startup company focusing on fraud detections and we were founded in uh, 2013, uh, late 2013. And uh, we literally just hit 100 people uh, team size uh, this week. So I'm glad to announce uh, our three digit employee IDs are finally available at this point. So going back to our business. Um, so uh, we fight against online attacks and in particular, we focus on those uh, coordinated attacks that happens in large scale. So in those attacking scenarios, typically uh, attackers will uh, grab a bunch of uh, malicious accounts, either by doing mass registrations themselves, or even better, uh, they can do it from account takeovers uh, to steal others' accounts. So once they own those malicious accounts, uh, they can launch a bunch of different attacks Accord, uh, depending on the business uh, that they're targeting for. For example, the fake reviews uh, on, some, um, on, uh, on those reput reputation systems or transaction fraud for financial uh, industries or promotional bills uh, for those online shopping uh, websites. So it's been studied that uh, the loss of uh, those uh, fraudulent activities uh, uh, result in a loss that's greater than 50 billions a year uh, all over the world. And our companies um, uh, is trying to develop some products to uh, help with that. So uh, the key algorithm that we use uh, is uh, unsupervised machine learning, uh, as you guys uh, might have heard uh, this um, uh, many times. So, so what is unsupervised machine learning? Uh, it basically means it does not require label which tells the machines which are good, which are bad. And instead, the machine is trying to figure out the correlation uh, between, those, um, uh, uh, between those activities. So let me make a really simple analogy. So if we look at the picture on the left, so that probably means, uh, doesn't mean uh, a lot of things unless you're an artist. But uh, if we try to look at uh, the big picture on the right, so we can clearly see this is a human. Uh, that's just because we are looking at um, uh, information at a different dimension. So that's exactly the idea of unsupervised machine learning uh, because it tries to capture the fraudulent activity from a higher dimension. So uh, because of that, it can achieve lots of benefits. For example, early detections, uh, we can detect uh, um, the malicious behavior even uh, in incubation period. And it can, it can adapt to unknown uh, attack uh, behavior that's never show up before. And we can achieve super high courage uh, and accuracy. So there are two, uh, there are two sides of a coin. Uh, if I were to uh, describe the drawback of uh, unsupervised machine learning in one word, that would be expensive. Well, in fact, if I can have two words, that would be super expensive. So uh, I'll illustrate uh, basically how our pipeline works. So uh, in, a, uh, in a very high level uh, point of view. So uh, we got the user events uh, from our customers and, and then we just extract the features uh, from those events. So know that we have a huge feature pool containing thousands of uh, features. And amongst uh, those features, our clustering algorithm is trying to figure out those unusual uh, correlation between uh, 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 among those events. Uh, by calculating some probabilities. So for example, uh, if we find uh, the probability of some uh, behavior pattern is extremely low uh, in normal, uh, under normal use case, uh, we, we detect them as fraud. So as you can probably sense uh, from, the uh, from the algorithm perspective here, uh, the, the amount of computation is proportional to the uh, number of uh, features, of course, and also proportional to the uh, number of uh, user, um, user or events uh, in the community. And in fact, in real production environments, uh, this, happens, uh, this happens super linearly. Uh, it's actually close to quadratic uh, in terms of a complexity. And because of that, uh, our problem becomes even harder when we are trying to serve uh, those top named brands uh, in the world, uh, which contains billions of users. 
So up to today, DataWise is protecting more than 3 billion user accounts all over the world, and we process more than 600 billion um, user events uh, from those uh, customers, and our data scale is at petabyte level. So in order to, de uh, in, order to pro uh, in order to consume those data uh, efficiently, we, de uh, we develop our pipeline using Apache Spark, and in fact, we spend uh, quite a amount of time in um, in uh, converting everything into Spark, such that our production system only have one kind of job to uh, ma manage uh, and, and maintain. But even though we do so, uh, uh, because of the complex of our algorithm, uh, our, uh, our, our module pipeline still contains 20-ish modules per client, and this depends on different clients uh, as well, because, of, uh, because they have uh, different product features. So how to uh, schedule and uh, manage those, um, uh, those modules becomes a problem that our production team uh, needs to handle uh, on a daily basis. So back into the very early days uh, in DataWiser, so this is a naive approach that we use uh, when we have only one customer, uh, which is why not you just use a single cluster? And what I mean by naive is uh, this is really um, a, a static cluster. It doesn't have uh, some modern features such, a, such as auto scale. So uh, it sounds pretty dumb, uh, but this is, um, this, is, uh, the, this is the solution we used uh, back in a couple of years ago. And if we try to use the same approach uh, to, to tackle the same scale that we have uh, today, uh, the estimated cloud cost will be $15 million uh, per year. And it would be a pretty bad idea for me to present this bill to my uh, CEO of the company because my badge will probably stop working uh, tomorrow. And this is a particular bad idea before I got my green card application. So we're going to make it better. So uh, if we look at the drawbacks uh, of, um, uh, of the static uh, cluster approach, uh, there, are two, uh, there are two major flaws. Number one is uh, the cluster size has, a co uh, has to uh, accommodate uh, the number of um, executors and executor uh, memories um, individually. So that's basically a least common um, multiplier problem. And this will definitely result in some waste. And secondly, what we find uh, that's really annoying, uh, that's, this is probably be, uh, because, of the, uh, because of the job profile that we have, because we are running unsupervised machine learning, those jobs are typically memory hogs. So we, we are very sensitive to uh, memory usage. So, uh, the, and the memory, memory waste problem uh, typically happens uh, when an application requires um, all the memories are on, a, on an executor, while the executor is occupied by small jobs. So, um, that, so pretty much the rest of the executor memory are waste. So um, by, by identifying the problem, we, we quickly come up with uh, uh, the version two, which is uh, we just split um, the cluster according to different executor size because we solved the memory uh, waste problem. And the estimate cost will drop down from 50 million to, uh, to 12 million uh, just by doing this, uh, uh, this um, simple approach. And uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward that uh, when we have a Spark job, it needs to submit to, uh, to the right cluster of the, of the right size. And in fact, we can further drop down the, the cloud cost to 8 million uh, by aggressively going for uh, spot instances uh, and, and cut the cluster size to just enough. However, uh, this, turns out, this turns out to increase our operational cost. Uh, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure some of you guys uh, might experience that uh, as well, because, uh, because spot instance, um, uh, we might lose it any, uh, any time. And if we really squeeze the, uh, the, the size of the cluster, uh, some jobs will just uh, run out of, um, uh, uh, out of resource, uh, just out of memory or out of disk because of the insufficient resource. So we really need to take the balance between uh, the cloud cost and operational cost. So at this point, we have done a lot of um, uh, exploration on the static cluster approach. So if we ask the drawback of the static cluster approach, it really comes down to these two root causes. Well, number one is fixed size, and number two is always on. So fixed size uh, will lead to the problem of uh, underutilization or over uh, under capacity or over capacity, depending on the workload. And always on uh, uh, will result in over, over capacity, of course, uh, when it's not being used. And uh, and we also pay attention to the maintenance cost because uh, remember the spot instances, uh, we, need to make, uh, we need to make sure that the cluster is always on. And, uh, and also, when we are doing some system upgrades or security patches, we need to push through all those uh, static, uh, 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 static servers, uh, which is um, another piece of amount of work that we need to uh, tackle. So all of these uh, adds up to human cost uh, and, uh, and cloud cost eventually. 
So at this point, if we, if we ask ourselves, can we go for dynamic cluster allocation by utilizing uh, the elasticity of cloud? Well, the question is really, why not? But before we build a system, uh, we want to, we hope the system to, um, uh, to address all of our uh, problems at, at once. So uh, we have more requirements to throw in. So uh, for example, uh, we are a multi-tenant system, so uh, we, uh, and we sell different product features for different customers, which result in a slightly different pipeline dependency uh, from client to client. And we hope um, we hope the new production system can elegantly uh, uh, solve this problem uh, without causing too much uh, trouble to our production team. And in addition, within the pipeline, some jobs are uh, so uh, indicated by the by the red dots. Uh, they are uh, they are higher priority than the others because they produce the detection results. So uh, and we have uh, SLA uh, on that. So when we are doing the scheduling problem, we really want to prioritize those jobs uh, to avoid um, uh, to avoid missing our SLA. So next, uh, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Bordeaux, uh, to talk about the system uh, that we built uh, to uh, address this problem. And we call this uh, SparkGen, uh, that stands for Spark Generator. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Yu Hao. Uh, I'm going to present SparkGen, which is a system we developed at JSONvisor. So SparkGen handles all of our Spark jobs and the Spark clusters at scale while with a low cost. So for SparkGen, there are uh, two major system components. The first component is a job scheduler. The second one is a resource manager. So as uh, you have just mentioned, uh, our clients may choose to use different product features from our pipeline. So uh, the pipeline differs from client to client. So our job scheduler will handle the different dependencies uh, of batch jobs for each client. And then job scheduler will kick off Spark jobs. While for Spark man uh, resource manager will take all the Spark job requests, including those requests from the job scheduler, as well as some random requests from developers. And uh, re the resource manager will decide when to launch a new cluster and how to assign jobs running on each cluster and monitor the jobs. And it may also decide to destroy some clusters uh, as needed. So with SparkGen, as we mentioned, we cut our bill from uh, $15 million if we use a naive approach as we did before to $3 million. This is a 5x reduction. So uh, here are the cost equations we consider when we design SparkGen. So we consider two uh, major types of cost. One is machine cost, the other is human cost. The so machine cost is mostly de uh, determined by the time that all your machines are up running, and plus the unit, uh, the unit price of machines charged by the cloud provider. And for human cost, we mainly refer to the operation overhead. So uh, our goal is to bring down all the three factors, the machine uptime, unit price, plus uh, operation overhead. Let's uh, first take a look at how we reduce our machine uptime. So uh, this, this figure shows the uptime of a cluster. So as we can see that there are basically three types of components if we break down the uh, cluster uptime. The yellow color shows the cluster launch time. So during this period, your whole cluster is being charged. However, you cannot do any computation with it. Of course, we want to uh, reduce the cluster launch time. So the purple color shows the idle time. A cluster could be idle because the, uh, the client data is not ready or some upstream uh, batch module is not finished. So there's no job that can ut utilize this cluster. And of course, we want to reduce the idle time too. So the green color shows the time when there are jobs running on the cluster. Uh, however, in many cases, uh, as we have mentioned, we can, uh, the jobs cannot fully utilize the resource on the cluster, which means that your cluster is partially idle, which is represented by the, the gray color. So consider that the, the total area of the green color is the actual computation you need to perform, which is of a fixed size. So our goal is to try to make the cluster resource being fully, fully utilized, which means we, have, we can shrink the area of the gray color and we can further shrink the, uh, the uptime for the cluster. Again, these are a few options we have explored and uh, 
Uh, the first option is that we can use a large single static cluster and we run all the jobs on that cluster. So the benefit is that we only pay one time cost to launch the cluster. Um, however, because uh, we have to over provision resource on that cluster, there could be surges of the requirement uh, of uh, computation and in order to meet our SLA, we have to over provision the resource. So most of the time, uh, the cluster is either low, uh, not fully utilized or it's totally idle. So the second option is that we have, we launched multiple static clusters with different sizes. As we have shown, we can tune the ratio between memory and uh, uh, number of executors. And then we can smartly allocate our jobs based on the resource requirement to allocate them to different clusters to increase the resource utilization. However, they are still static clusters. So there, there will be uh, idle time on the clusters. So the third option is our uh, solution we adopted. So we call it one job per cluster. Uh, so it means that for each Spark job, we will launch a new cluster for the job. And the cluster could be of exactly the size required by the job. And then we run the job. After the job finish, we just destroy the cluster. So this way, we have to pay the cost to launch a cluster for each job. But the gain is that we have a very high resource uh, utilization, and we totally eliminate the idle time for a cluster. And with this approach, only we, we just save about 60% of uh, our cloud bill. And be besides the cutoff for our cloud bill, there are some other benefits of uh, one job per cluster. So when there are multiple jobs ready to run, one job cluster can scale out dynamically by just launching new clusters. And with, uh, uh, with static clusters, there could be inter-job interference. For example, if a job hangs there for a long time, or a job just run much longer than expected, uh, so this may block the other jobs in the queue. So uh, in this case, a simple uh, single issue may propagate greatly to a much wider range. Uh, but with one job cluster, we have a single, uh, we have a dedicated cluster for each job, so there's no uh, inter-job in interference. And again, we also have a low maintenance overhead with one job cluster because we can either patch or relaunch a cluster easily without affecting any other jobs. So uh, overall, with our approach, uh, instead of using some designing some fancy mechanism to solve our scalability and the cost issues, we, we just adopt a relatively simple solution which can fully utilize the elasticity of uh, a cloud environment. Now, now let's take a deeper look at the single negative point, which is a cluster launch. So we took a few steps to bring down the cluster launch time. Uh, so one, one step we did is that we pre-built machine images so that uh, we can reduce the work we have to be we have to be uh, we have to do at the cluster launch time. So in the pre-built image, we pre-installed all the systems and the libraries required by the Spark cluster, and uh, we dockerize all the system and libraries so that it is, uh, we have a better portability for them to, in different cloud environment, in different computation environment, and uh, it's much easier to manage them. We also pre-configured all the system unless the configuration can only be determined at the runtime. The second step is that we initialize a Spark master and the slaves concurrently. So this plot shows the slave initialization. Uh, we organize the slave initialization into two phases. In phase one, uh, the initialization can be done totally locally without con connecting to the master. And in the second phase, uh, the master has to be up ready before the second phase starts. So usually the second phase is uh, pretty short because it contains only the start of some services that will connect to the master. So in a naive way to launch the cluster, master will be launched first, and then we initialize one slave at a time, which takes a pretty long time. So in our approach, we can start the initialization of master and slaves at the same time. 
and only the second phase of some slaves potentially could be blocked by the uh, initialization of master. And uh, this way we can uh, bring down our cluster launch time from about 30 minutes to three minutes. As I also mentioned, we can opt uh, maximize our job concurrency with one job per cluster. Uh, let me just show some details here. So given, the, given a pipeline, uh, if we just use uh, one static big cluster, then a naive way is to execute all the jobs sequentially, which obviously takes a pretty long time. And with one job cluster, whenever there is a job ready, we just launch a new cluster and to run it. For example, after job A finishes, job B, C, and D are ready to run. In this case, we just launch three separate clusters and uh, run all of them at the same time, and so on and so forth. So with this approach, uh, we managed to bring down our pipeline latency by 2x. And another benefit is that because each job has its own cluster, and we totally get rid of the uh, issue for prioritization. Again, back to our cost equations. Uh, the second factor we try to reduce is the machine unit price. Um, maybe you all know that uh, for AWS, there are different pricing policies. So by paying some upfront charge, you can bring down, you can convert an on-demand instance into a reserved instance with a much lower price. And you can further cut the price by using spot instances. The problem of spot instances is that uh, AWS may decide to reclaim those spot instances when the availability is low. So in our case, we use spot instances for Spark slaves, um, which will cut our price by 75%. We can use spot because uh, if we lose a slave, basically we'll, we lose some partitions of RDDs, and uh, Spark will try to recompute, uh, uh, try to recover just by recomputing those uh, RDD partitions. Uh, however, Spark is hard to recover if we lose a master. So instead of using Spot, we use a reserved instance as a master, which also gives us uh, about 40% of savings. And the third factor we try to reduce is the uh, operation overhead. Um, with static cluster, there could be some issues that require us to handle manually. So with one drop clusters, uh, some issues are gone. For example, we have mentioned that uh, one dropper cluster can scale out very easily by launching new clusters, and there's no interjob interference. We can easily patch and relaunch clusters. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that for the spot slaves, we use a spot fleet. So spot fleet is a feature provided by AWS. So it's essentially, spot fleet is also a set of spot instances. But spot fleet will try to diversify those instances along two dimensions. One dimension is the availability zone. The other dimension is the uh, cluster type. So with this diversification, uh, we have a higher availability of those uh, spot slaves. It means that you're much less likely to lose the majority of your uh, spot slaves. But there's still some chance that uh, you lose some of them. Spot fleet in this case will try to uh, create, uh, we'll try to launch you a new slave instance to add to the cluster. So relatively, you, it's easy for you to maintain a stable size of your whole cluster. So you may want to ask a question, okay, why don't we use yarn? Yes, you can, use, you can just use a large yarn cluster and assign all the jobs to the yarn cluster. And the yarn cluster can scale up and scale in dynamically. And uh, based on the job resource requirement, yarn can allocate your, uh, your jobs smartly into the cluster to increase the uh, uh, resource utilization. But there are still some drawbacks of yarn. First is that there's a single point failure of the yarn master. So it, it, if it happens, you, you, lo you lose your master, uh, all of the jobs running, currently running on the cluster will be affected. However, with one job cluster, once we lose a master, only one job is affected. So it's much easier to recover. Uh, for Yarn, I think compared to one job cluster, it's slower to scale. Because when a job is ready to run, 
we are clear that uh, how much resource we would like to uh, to get from the cloud to run that job. With one job cluster, you can immediately just launch a new cluster with exactly the same size required by the job. And uh, uh, I think uh, all of you may know that we have enough number of systems to maintain and uh, configure. So Yarn just add one more system to the list. Uh, lastly, I want to uh, mention our job scheduler. Uh, as we mentioned earlier that our clients may choose to use different product features uh, from us. So the pipeline may differ from, uh, from client to client. So how to manage the, uh, the diversity in the pipeline in production is pretty challenging. So as a job scheduling, we use uh, uh, Luigi. Luigi is an open source job scheduler, uh, which is uh, pretty popular for, for uh, data pipeline. So for Luigi, uh, for each client, we only need to specify a few product features for this client, which is represented by the yellow circles. And Luigi can dynamically uh, generate the complete data pipeline graph based on the production, uh, product features. And based on the pipeline, Luigi will submit jobs to our resource manager. So in, in this way, for each client, we, we only need to maintain a relatively simple spec. This is much easier for us to manage, and uh, it's much simpler for us to onboard new clients, uh, which happens pre pretty frequently now. OK, uh, as a summary, we build a Spark Gen to handle all, our, all of our Spark jobs and the Spark clusters at Datavisor. And with Spark Gen, we manage to scale uh, to, uh, at peak time, we manage to scale our computation to 4x. Uh, and compared to some naive approach we adopted before, we can cut the bill by five times. And we also reduce our operation overhead by 4x. At the same time, we re reduce our pipeline latency uh, by 2x. OK, that's all we'd like to present today. Um, thank you. We're ready to, OK. Thank you. <laughs>